All right, the title of my sermon this morning is Training Your Children. Training Your Children. So just a reminder today about discipline. Um, I've, I've done, I've, I'm preaching this one a little bit different because going through um, not only principles, so first of all, I'm going to cover principles about training our children from the Bible, but I'm also going to go through a timeline of expectations. So I think this is what may help you because people are always wondering, when do I spank, what do I spank, things like that, what, do I, what should I expect from my children? So Elizabeth and I sort of sat down and thought about the ages of our children and kind of like what we expect from them and what I think you should be able to expect from your children. Ultimately, you have to decide what standard you're going to set in your house. So training your uh, children, and this comes from Proverbs 22, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. I think when you dwell on this verse, there's so much to this, and it's, it's really important that you internalize this, that what you set in motion when your children are younger, they're going to carry with them when they're older. So if you are not diligent with your children, if you drop the ball, if you start getting lazy, that's what you're training, right? Rather than training the right things. So I know I'm going to be talking about teaching children today. Maybe you don't have children. Maybe you, you may never have children, or maybe you don't have children yet, or maybe your children are already grown up and old, and this may not be so applicable to your situation. But still listen up because it's important. Like I say in every sermon where it's applicable to a certain demographic, it's still important for you, for everybody, to learn what the Bible has to say about this, whether it's to be able to explain it to somebody else, whether it's to know for future, whether it's to give counsel to people that are younger than you or people that have children. You know, it's, so it's always profitable to learn the biblical um, perspective on any topic, even though it may not apply to your specific scenario at this very moment. So let's, you need to reset your thinking. Whenever we learn about a topic from the Bible, you know, you may come into a topic like this, especially training your children, raising your children, and just have a mindset of like, hey, this is how it was done in my family, this is how I think it's done, and this is what was done to me. It's always good when you look into the Bible on a certain topic to, to reset your mind, renew your mind, and think, okay, well, if I didn't know anything, what would the Bible teach me first? on how to raise my children, I get the principles there, and then I judge what the world is doing. Are they doing it the right way? I judge, well, how did my parents raise me, or what are other parents doing to raise their children, and seeing, are they following biblical principles? It should never be, well, they did that, and I turned out all right, and they did this, and I turned out all right. Yeah, well, then you're a bit rolling the dice a bit. You know, yeah, God can be gracious, right? Life can be gracious to us in the sense that we don't always do the right thing, but things can work out. But does that mean that's what we should be seeking? You know, it's best to learn the ideal principles so that we use them, and if, especially if God has given us so much information in the Bible about this. So first of all, I'm going to go through four principles, just, ba just Bible principles on child rearing, and then at the end, I'm going to go through a bit of a timeline of expectations, and that could give you an idea of uh, how we go about things. And I'll, I'll give some examples a bit later. I've got my spanking stick here. I was, I was joking that you know, some churches have like flowers on the bottom and flowers on there. And I'm just like, I've got this in the middle there, you know, the rod of correction. And I, I forgot, I, I had a clown last time and I forgot to bring something for my, my kids. Sarah brought her dolls. I'll, I'll use that later to show you how I do things. Okay, so the first question that people ask is a starting age. Like a lot of people ask, well, you know, how young do you start disciplining your children? And things like that. Uh, let's have a look at some Bible verse. The Bible obviously doesn't give an exact age, but what we know is we, we ought to start as soon as we can, right? As soon as is practical. For me, I think it starts around six to, six to 12 months is when you start, you know, children start to become aware of their surroundings. You can say no, you can start moving their hands and things like that. But let's look at some principles first in Proverbs 13. Verse 24, the Bible says, He that spareth his rod, look at this, hateth his son. So that's some pretty strong language in the Bible. The Bible's saying, hey, you know, people will say things like, if you spare the rod, you spoil the child. 
That's not even what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that if you spare the rod, you hate your child. That's some pretty strong language. That's saying that you've like forsaken them. You have something against them because you don't, you're not loving them enough to actually discipline them, to give them what they need. He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. See, so when you chasten your children, this is never done out of hatred. You know, don't do it. Like God doesn't chasten us out of hatred. His children chasten us because he loves us. He wants to correct us. But we see here, he that loveth him, chasteneth him betimes. What is this word? This word means early. Right? So you want to start as early as possible training up your children. Look at this. Proverbs 19, 18. Chasten thy son while there is hope. You know what that tells me, that passage? That means there's going to come a time where there's no hope anymore. That could come a time where it's like, it doesn't matter what you do, it's going to be vain because you've left it till too late. You didn't train up a child in the way they should go from an early age. Now you're trying to make up for it. And how many people you see in that situation? Parents that didn't raise their children in the right ways and now their children won't listen to them. They're, they're adults now and they've you know, gone down the wrong path because they were not given the right start. Chasten thy son while there is hope. I mean, if we don't know when that hope runs out, when you can no longer affect change into your child, don't, don't you want to start as early as possible? And, you know, I hear people have this frame of mind sometimes with children, like they say things, they say things like, ah, oh, you know, let children be children. I don't know where this, I don't know where this came from, where this idea comes from, because people say things like that. Oh, kids are kids, let them be kids. And I get kids are going to play. You know, kids are going to do kids things like, they're going to play and have fun and things like that. That's not what I'm referring to. What I'm referring to is the character of children. When children grow up, you know, they're selfish. They only care about themselves. They're not considerate. And people just think, ah, oh, you know, kids are messy. Let kids be kids. Kids are inconsiderate. Let kids be kids. But... We're not, we're not trying to, we don't want our kids to stay kids. You know what I mean? We want our kids to start getting growing and training and growing in character. I don't, why, why would I let my kids be kids? You know, that's just losing the short time you have. See, the longer you wait to start disciplining and teaching and training your child in the way you should go, you're just losing that time. I mean, how much time do you think you have with your children? I mean, life just goes just like that. And, but, you, but people say things like, oh, you know, I'm not going to spank my child until they're like five years old. You know, five years old is when... So, so you're going to like, you know, not do anything for five years? You know, not discipline? So that basically you're saying, for four years, I'm going to teach them that there's no punishments, there's no discipline, just for four years. So, so what are you training them to do? And it's not like there just comes a time where you just flick a switch and then just change their behavior like that. You think it's so easy to change the behavior of a child? No, it requires daily, consistent discipline. So if you just put it off for years and years and years, not only are you losing that time, but you are establishing bad habits for many, many, many years because it's a lot of things going unpunished for four years. You know, five years, I've heard that number out there, like, you know, five years is when you just start spanking them. So like what, for three years, it's fine to be a little tantruming brat? And then all of a sudden, oh, now, now you're five, now you can't do it. You know, that's going to be a lot harder because not only now do you have to teach them to not do that, you have to undo the habits that they've been learning as they've been growing up. So you need to start as early as possible, right? So that you can give as well the best you've got because we're not perfect. We're not perfect parents. You need as much time as you can get. So if you're giving time away, just you know, following into the world's ideas of training your children and just saying, oh, you know, let's let children be children, man, life is short. Don't give that time away. That's why we need to use that time to train them. You know, some people, uh, you know, uh, like say, oh, spanking should only be five years old, four years old, five years old. I think it's way earlier, right? Like one, one and a half should already be starting. Um, but I heard as well, like the world, if, you're, if you sort of go the positive parenting, worldly philosophies, they'll say things like, oh, you know, you don't need to spank your children. You just got to like be able to negotiate with them and negotiate an outcome and, you know, and you can convince them. But then, if, if, you see, if you wait to that point with children, that, that means it requires 
a, a, a mental capacity for them to be able to reason. I mean, you ever tried to reason with a two-year-old? Like, you know, the toy, you take the toy away from them, they just like, go get another toy, right? <laughs> like, they, there's no reason there that you need to implement something else. So generally, if people are just trying to reason with their children, they're not going to start really taking an effect until maybe three, four years old. So you've already missed a couple of years where you could have already been instilling some habits, right? And when they're younger, I mean, you don't have to spank as hard. I mean, it's so much easier when you start younger if you just set a habit in place. And what's funny is when we think about training our children, I mean, people know this instinctively with animals. You know, you get an animal at home, a dog, you start potty training it, you tell the teacher to, to shake hand, and you start as soon as they're young. But then when it comes to our children, they think, ah, oh, just let kids be kids. I mean, do, do people do that with their dogs? They don't just get a dog home and just, hey, just let dogs be dogs, just chew this and poo there, poo there. You know, hey, just let them be dogs for a couple of years, and then in three years, then I'm going to tell the dog, don't do that. No. I mean, as soon as you get them, you, you start instilling that character so slowly over time, they, they, they learn. All right, so um, I'm just thinking, like, I'm, I'm, this is a long sermon. <laughs> so I'm I've got a lot to go through, so hopefully I'll try and go through it a bit quicker. So train up a child in the way he should go. You know, I think about sports as well. You know, when you're training in sports, you don't just take a break for years and years and years, and then all of a sudden, hey, let's learn the fundamentals. Even when you teach kids sports, they start learning the fundamentals. You know, even in soccer, you see them, okay, start learning the dribbling, start learning the part. You're learning the fundamentals from very early on. And just think about how difficult it is to undo habits, even in sport. It's the same in life. And you're always going to be training your children because the training never ends. They'll always be testing their boundaries, right? They'll always be testing what you do. Now, I wanted to just go to this passage. This is Proverbs 22. And I've kind of taught this passage differently because I've understood it differently. But when I was sort of thinking about this sermon and thinking about this passage, I think I've actually misunderstood this passage in Proverbs 22.8. But the Bible says, He that soweth iniquity shall reap vanity, and the rod of his anger shall fail. Now, I've always used this passage to say, hey, the attitude in which you discipline and whatnot. And there are other passages we can use to say that. But what I think this is actually saying is, this is not teaching the rod of his anger in the sense that when you spank with the rod, you are angry. What this is actually teaching, I believe, is that when it says, he that soweth in it, because you remember Proverbs 22, 6 was train up a child in the way it should go. So this is like two verses later. It's saying, he that soweth iniquity shall reap vanity and the rod of his anger shall fail. What I believe this can, be, this can apply to is, see, if you don't train up a child in the way it should go, if you are training up a child in sin, right, and in rebellion, and, and just sowing, you know, like some parents, right, they just let their kids do whatever. Let them watch whatever, play games, whatever, social media, just hang out with it. You know, you send them to public school and then their friends are just, fr they're just friends with whoever. So all those years, you've been sowing iniquity and then you reap vanity. And then what do parents do when their kids are older? I can't believe you did this. Oh, what are you thinking? Why are you going out and sleeping with this guy? Why are you going out and getting drunk? And you're trying to use your anger as a rod. And now it's, it fails. It doesn't do anything. Why? Because for all those years, you've been training up the wrong thing. You've been sowing iniquity. And just like people do that with their teenagers and all that stuff, it, you may do that with your young one, right? Where you didn't spank them from one, two years old. You didn't start telling them, don't touch this, don't touch that, take that out of your mouth, don't jump on the furniture. Now they're three, four years old, they're jumping on the phone, you know, you call them, they're not listening to you. It's like, hey, hey, Johnny, 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 and he's just like, because you've let him run away and not listen to you for one, two, three years old, and now you're like, I can't believe you're not listening to me, you're kidding me, you know, getting so angry, but you've sown iniquity for so many years, and now the rod of your anger doesn't do anything, it's failing. Because anger doesn't change children. See, if you've trained them wrong, now you're just getting angry at them, that's not going to do anything. Training changes children. Right? You've got to train, train them and teach them and discipline them 
That's what's going to change them. The rod of correction, right? Not the rod of anger, the actual rod of correction. Not anger. So that's why I, I just thought that was a bit of an uh, interesting point because I, I think I had always misunderstood that passage. I think that's what that is actually teaching and how we can apply it to child rearing. So that was the first point. First principle is you've got to start as early as possible. Second principle is just a reminder that spanking your children is a biblical practice. You know, I know probably one day it's going to be outlawed in Australia because they're outlawing it all over the place because, you know, guess what? They're probably going to outlaw the Bible everywhere. But in the house of God amongst Christians, there are Christians that don't support spanking, that don't support beating with the rod and disciplining your children and having negative consequences to actions. But the Bible's very clear that spanking your children is biblical. Proverbs 23, apply thine heart unto instruction and thine ears to the words of knowledge. Withhold not correction from the child. For if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Thou shalt beat him with the rod, and shalt deliver his soul from hell. I always just think that passage is so interesting, that it, it actually connects learning, discipline, negative consequences in your life, pain as a teacher, connecting that with a person's salvation. So somehow, teaching your child and disciplining them in a biblical way has an effect on their spiritual life. Now this is not only in the Old Testament. We see chastening in the New Testament as well. Hebrews 12. And you've forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and look at this, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Doesn't that sound like a spanking? See, so it's not just words, right? It's not just correcting and rebuking somebody. The chastening is, is a scourging. It's a physical thing. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? So you can see here, what sort of parent are you if you let your children go, 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 and be naughty without any physical discipline? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall, not much, shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? So see, the assumption here is that they already know that biblical corporal punishment or spanking is something that is done. And he's comparing, well, wouldn't God as well as a loving parent spank his children just like our physical fathers do that? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of unrighteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. So see, if you spank, it will make a difference. So it is a biblical practice, and it is a good practice. It will actually make a difference if you practice it the right way. Right? So you don't do it out of anger and just you know, abuse your kids. Right? You're, you are purposefully implementing a punishment, just like the law system does. Like the law system doesn't just react. There's, there's a crime, there's a trial. If they've broken it, then they get a punishment. That's how you should think of it in your house, that you are the judge and executioner. Right? In the sense that you execute out this punishment of corporal punishment. And I always find... It's funny in the world because, you know, out there in the world, obviously, there is the idea that, you know, it's wrong and blah, 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 and it's abusive and everything like that, even though the Bible teaches it. But I don't know if you've ever read an article on positive parenting. I always find it hilarious when you read an article on positive parenting, you just scroll down and just read all the comments, right? And the comments below are just all the mums that are like losing their minds because their kids are throwing tantrums in the store and you know I'm trying to do this positive parenting and what do you guys do when your kids just like pulling things off the shelf in the store and they're having a meltdown and then all the mums chime in like don't worry you're doing a great job you're doing it right and everything like that. and I just think I, I, I've never I never had that experience because when they you know when they threw a tantrum at home you, you spanked it out of them and then at the store, they're not rolling around on the ground, throwing a tantrum, hitting, hitting you, throwing things off the shelf. 
So I think it's always funny when, you know, you have that sort of, those sort of comments there. And we've got to understand, you know, there's the perception of spanking that the world has, and then there's the reality of it. See, because the perception that the world has of spanking is like some, you know, frustrated, crazed parent chasing after their kids and like hitting them. Or like, you know, you think about the Spanish mom taking off her shoe, you know, and like a sandal and like slapping her kids. That's the world's mentality. When they think spanking, that's, they think that's what sort of parent you are. And when you, and when you read up studies on spanking, you know, and people say, oh, you know, how many parents spank and they have all these problems and blah, blah, blah. Like I've read some of the introductions to those studies and I remember reading some where it said the definition of spanking was just like an open-handed slap on the bottom. So that means if a parent has a kid, you know, doesn't even take off the clothes. I know this is a baby, but you know, obviously I'm just using this as a prop. Doesn't even take off the clothes and it's like they do something wrong and then they just say, oh, bad. That, even though the child, did no, no crying, nothing, just like complain, just went, Ugh, you know, and they just do that. They would consider that, that's a spanking. That is not, that's not a spanking. You know, a spanking has to be bare bottom, slap, they will cry, and they will change. You know, they, they, they will change eventually because they will not want to feel that again. So there's the perception versus the reality of spanking. And, um, you know, studies don't normally look, do that. They just think if you hit child any way in any form, then that's spanking. So don't buy into the world's deception of child rearing. And you need to make sure both parents are spanking. You know, both parents need to be involved in the discipline because you don't want your kids to learn that they can get away with some things with mom and not get away with it with dad and vice versa. You know, they don't get away with it with mom and then dad's looking after the kids, they're getting away with it. If you're both spanking, then they can't get away with things. And when you're both spanking as well, you can support each other. Right, first of all, you both know how it feels to spank your kids, but you can support each other in the sense that sometimes you're not in the right frame of mind to spank your children. Maybe you're overly frustrated and then somebody else. So if you're frustrated and you're really angry, you can have your partner spank the kids and then they can do it more firmly, more calmly in, in the way it should be done. So you can support one another. But see, if you're both going to spank, if you're both going to discipline your children, you need to both agree on what to discipline them about. So you need to talk to each other. Guys, you talk to each other, parents have to discuss and talk things through and say, hey, they did this, is this acceptable? You know, what are we gonna set? You know, next time they do this, is it, is it a reasonable punishment? You need to both agree because you know what? You know what's even more stressful about already raising children and disciplining them and having to go and spank them? is when somebody else is going, oh, you know, you shouldn't be spanking them, you're being too hard on them. And, uh, the, like, I don't know if you've ever been in that situation, maybe where, you know, where you were, you're your parents-in-law or something like that, with your parents, and then, you know, you're spanking them for something you know that they're being naughty about. And then your parents, you know, the, you know, the grandparents are like, oh, just let them be kids, that's what kids do, you're being too hard on them. Man, that's really stressful. That, that stresses you out even more. So, you know, if you, you're in that seat, imagine, you know, it's even worse when it's like your, your, your husband and wife doing that to each other. So don't ruin your family environment. Get on the same page so that when you do discipline your children, you're both supporting each other because it's hard enough already to raise children. It's even harder to discipline them right. You're going to make it even harder if you don't agree on things and support each other. Look what it says here in Proverbs 29. This is a great verse. I don't know if you've ever read this before. Correct thy son, and he shall give thee rest. He shall give delight unto thy soul. Now that's a, that's a great verse to remind you. You know, it's actually, it's like laziness. You know, it's easier just to be diligent, just do things right. You have to do things again, make it hard for yourself. It's the same with children. You get lazy, disciplining your children, letting things go. But you, do you know what? It's actually easier if you just do it. If you do it early, you do it consistently, man, it actually makes your life so much easier. Why? Because your children are going to be a blessing to have around. They're going to be pleasant. They're going to be obedient. They're going to sit quietly. They're going to do what they're told. It's funny because when people, I tell people I've got five kids at work, they just like lose their mind. Why do they do that? Because they probably know one kid who's a brat 
they didn't get discipline, it's making their parents' life hell, and they're thinking, you got five of those? No, no, I don't have, I don't have five of those. You know, like, I have five well-behaved children, and that's why they're, they're a blessing. And that's why, you know, when they say, oh, you want more? You want more kids? You're nuts. Well, no, because when you have kids that give you rest and give delight unto your soul, you want more of them. But if you don't discipline them and they're a burden to you and, they're, and they're hard, then that's when you don't want any more, right? And a lot of people, they have one, two kids, they're like, oh man, that's enough, right? Well, it's because they didn't discipline them biblically because they did, they'd want more, right? Or maybe, maybe there's other reasons why they don't want them. Third, third is attitude, having the right attitude when you spank. Now, I know when I teach on child rearing, I focus a lot on the negative aspect, right? The discipline and the child rearing and the spanking. But you need to remember there's the positive side also of it. And the reason why I emphasize the negative side because the positive side is most people do it without even thinking, right? You spoil your kids, you take them here, you buy them this, you buy them that. I mean, most parents just have like toys going out the windows, you know, for their kids. So the, the, the positive side is generally just overstated in our society. But in some cultures and in some groups, it's not. And especially sometimes in, in, in Bible, like in, in southern United States where spanking is just spanking and to the point where they're almost abusive, right? The children have got like cuts and all sorts of things and they're, they're so negative, they have no relationship with their kids because all they do is they just spank them, they send them to Sunday school, they send them to school, every time they see their parents it's all negative, parents are so busy. No, no, there needs to be the other side as well where we have the love as well as the correction because if you don't, if you just only have correction and discipline your children are going to grow up bitter right? because they don't know that you're doing it out of love they just they just think it's just hatred that they're getting from you ephesians 6 says and ye fathers provoke not your children to wrath but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the lord so you see how there is the two you need both the love and the discipline you need the positive reinforcement when they do something good and you need the negative reinforcement when they do something wrong. And that's where the world goes wrong with this positive-only parenting, is they're only doing one side of the coin, and it's not as effective as doing both. Right? You need to punish the negative and reinforce the positive. Now, this is why it's so important that you comfort your children after you spank them. Right? So when you spank them, you know, I think if you just spank your kids and they don't know that you love them, especially younger children, to me, it just, there's a sense, I, even with my own children, if you, if you don't comfort them, when they get spanked, I think there's something inherent in a child that they don't want to disappoint their parents. Right? They, they, the parent, like kids really feel down when they think their parents don't love them, when they think their parents have something against them. I don't know if you've ever noticed that with your children or with other children, but you know, I know with my kids, if they've done something wrong and I say, hey, you know, say I'm sorry and then I'll say I forgive you and then it's like a load, I feel like there's like a load off their mind. That they can go back and have fun now because they know like, you know, they, they know they're not getting spanked just because daddy's angry at them or daddy doesn't like them. It's that, no, daddy likes you, I'm spanking you just to correct a certain behavior. And I think if you spank them and just leave them at that, you leave them with that feeling like, oh, daddy's just spanking me because he's not liking me. As opposed to daddy's spanking me because I've done something wrong, but I still feel the love from him. So that's why I think it's very important that when you discipline your children, you should comfort them as well. You, know, you just discipline them and abandon them. You discipline them, you comfort them, especially for younger children, you know, two, three, four years old. I think it's a lot more important that you comfort them as well, you reassure them, and then I find that that, you know, if you take that extra step, when they go back to do what you've asked them to do, they'll have a better attitude about it. Nurture and add Admonition. So you want to have the right attitude. So attitude as well helps if you have higher standards in terms of when you ask your child to do something and you expect them to do it the first time rather than the tenth time, that's going to help you be calmer as well. So rather than ask them again and again and again, and then you spank them, you say, oh, I've asked you to do it so many times and now I've like lost them at the end of my rope. And then you spank them, you have a less calm frame of mind. You know, if I expect my child to do something after the tenth time I've asked them, why don't I just up the standard and just go, when I tell you once, that's enough. See, if you start early, 
that, that there's easier to hold that standard where if I just say, hey, if, you, if I tell you to do this and you didn't do it, ah, well, you didn't do it. You know, I'll ask Simon or something and say, what did I ask you to do? And he repeats it to me. So that proves, okay, well, you heard it. You heard it, you understood it, so next time do it when I ask you the first time. So that, 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 that would be something that they could get a spanking for. Um, so asking, expecting them to do it earlier helps with your frame of mind. Proverbs 29, look at this, the rod and reproof. Right, so not only having the right attitude, not only spanking them, but teaching them as well. See, when they do something wrong, teach them. Explain to them why it's wrong. Explain to them what it is that they did wrong. Like, if they, if they, like, let me give you an example, right? Let's say your kids are going over and then they touch the PowerPoint, right? They touch the PowerPoint and you just go, you just go grab them. They touch, they touch you just grab them and go like, no, nah, nah, give them a smack. And it's like, okay, you know, deal with yourself, you know? Like, you're not going to be like that with your kid, right? Obviously, you're not going to throw them. I mean, they're walking and then, because this dog doesn't walk. But this is what I do, right? Let's say they touch, even at Noah's age, one and a half years old, right? Noah's starting to touch things, walk over. So I'll be like, whoa, they'd say, no. I'd say, Noah, no. No, don't touch the PowerPoints, right? If you do it again, daddy's going to give you a smack, all right? And she'll like, look at you. And just be like, she touches her, then I go, take her, give her, go for a smack and pull the pants down. I even use this one for Noah, right? So I think with, you just smack them a little bit softer, right? So hey, pull the pants down, three or four, she'll be crying. Yeah. I told you not to touch the PowerPoint. You touch the PowerPoint, it's all right, okay. Yeah, come. Then after, take her back to the PowerPoint. Make sure you don't touch the PowerPoints, okay? And then she'll go about, and then if it happens again another day, then you go through the same process. So you see how it's not just a, hey, go, go. It's, it's, it's a purposeful training. You know, Sarah's laughing because she's seen me do it before, right? It's a, it's a purposeful training of like, because it's the, funny because the kids start doing it to each other, right? Like, no, ah, no, don't touch the PowerPoint. Right? So, so that's what I'm saying. You need to, it's rod and reproof. So you, you spank them, you need to explain to them. Don't underestimate how much they understand. And even Noah, you think Noah's just clueless there? No, no, like when she starts to stand up in her chair, and I'm like, Noah, sit down, she'll be like, stick her legs back in, right? <laughs> because before I've taken her off the chair and spanked her and put her back in, right? So it's, I'm just saying, like, just you need to think about when I say spanking, just get that picture of training. Right? Training your children. You actually like explain, like, don't do this. So, you know, if you touch this, it could hurt you. And, and other kids hear it as well. So you're just reinforcing it in your house. You spank and then you remind. Even if like, you know, maybe Noah will draw on the floor or something or she'll draw on something, she'll spill something. You know, you point to it. Make her look at it and go, no, no throwing water on the floor. You know, give, and you say, if you do it again, you're going to get a smack. So then we do, hey, Noah, you spill water on the floor, I told you not to do it, spank, how do you spank, and you show them again. So you're like sort of training and reinforcing them. That's how, that's how we do it. So explanation. You know, they didn't obey when they were told. Like I said, to, like when, same with Simon, like uh, Simon and Timothy, I would say, what did I ask you to do? They'll tell me. And I say, so I, there's some talking there going on. I'm not just disciplining them without any reproof. And also, like, we give them reasons as well. So don't just think, it's, you know, so in our house, it's not just don't do it because I told you so, you know, and you never explain to them. The part of the training is reproof. You're, you, see, you're trying to give them wisdom, right? The rod and proof give wisdom. But a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. Why? Because a child left to himself doesn't always know, understand why things are wrong. So we explain it to them. Hey, this is why I don't want you to do this. This is what it can result in. So it's not just they walk away thinking like, oh, mommy and daddy just don't want us to have fun. No, no, because we, we explain to them this is why and we just talk to them and keep teaching them and then that sets some good habits for them. All right, let's get on to number four. Hopefully that was enough there. Number four is probably a bit longer. How, the how-tos of spanking. 
So people ask different questions about how, what, what, what uh, instrument to use. And I think the Bible is very clear that we use a rod. We actually use an instrument to spank our children. I don't know where this doctrine in our church came from, of hand, using the hand, right? So I, I, I don't think it's a good idea to use a hand to spank. Like sometimes you, you must. You know, if it's of necessity and you don't have anything, then you can use your hand. But ideally, the Bible teaches that there is a rod of correction. There's an instrument that is used. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. So there is an instrument that is being used, and I think there's some wisdom in that. Why? Because if you think about it, people, people get this idea when you spank a child that it's more humane to spank them with your hand. Now, if you, if you realize your hand is like floppy, right? And it's, there's not like a hard surface. So when you smack somebody with your hand, first of all, you need to smack them quite accurate to get a slap. And if, and if you, you have to smack them pretty hard for it to stink. So when, when you smack them with your hand, it's actually more dangerous because you're hitting them harder than you need to, to inflict the pain. And if you're not hitting them hard enough, they're probably not even feeling the pain for that spanking to be effective. So when you have an instrument, first of all, you have more control over this. And when you spank them, you can actually spank them softer to get a sting out of it and you, you don't risk actually injuring the child. So people have this idea that it's so inhumane to use an instrument. And even there, you know, there'll people you know, make up things and say, well, you know, you can spank your children, but you can't spank them with an instrument, which I don't believe is Australian law because I've spanked them with an instrument and I haven't been in trouble yet and, you know, got, I had police come over and all sorts of things and told them this is what I spanked them with. So, it's actually more humane, the point I'm making is, it's a lot more humane to spank with something because you have more control and you actually hit them softer overall. And that's why I believe the Bible tells us that there is a rod of correction. So you shouldn't be spanking all the time with your hand. You should be spanking with a rod. And the best place to spank them is on the bum, right? Because the bum is a soft padded area. So that's ideal. But sometimes I will spank on the arm. You know, if, they did, if they're touching something, I'll just grab their arm and just give them a, a slap on the arm, right? Or um, even a slap on the leg if you're out and about, right? And sometimes it's easier because the older kids, you're not going to get them to pull down their pants. At home, we just get them to pull down their pants. <laughs> so <laughs> when they're older, they just stand in the room, they just pull their pants down, lift their shirt up, and then, you know, you've got free reign there to, <laughs> to, to lay some nice ones on there. So you use a rod. We use, the, this is, if you're wondering what this is, this is a shoehorn from Ikea. They cost about three bucks. We find these are the best because we used to use like wooden spoons and wooden spatulas, but wood like just chips and breaks too easily. So when we got plastic, Ricky actually saw this in Ikea and, and bought one for us and we've been using them ever since. But one is because it's plastic, so um, it doesn't chip as easy. But also you want something that is somewhat flat as opposed to something that is round and hard. So some people use like a wooden spoon, but I don't think a wooden spoon is, is, as, um, is, as, is as good because it's a bit more hard and round than it is flat. So if something's flat, you get more of a slap than you do something like just a, like a blunt force sort of hit. So we really like these, they're very cheap, they can ha hang up and we've got them like hanging up all around the house. So the reason why I recommend having sticks around the house is because you want to make it easy to spank early, right? But if you think your child just did something and I've got to take them all the way there and do something, you may not do it. But whereas it's just at hand, you're, li you're more likely to do it than to not do it. So we use a rod um, and, and, and it's like that. Like where on the body, like I said, arm, leg, bum, uh, like, how do you restrain them? So I gave some tips last time I preached on this, but the way I restrain my kids, if you have... I tend to use a couch. I'm just using a chair as an example, right? I would use a couch, like a, a single-seater couch or something like that. But the way I do it is... For the older kids, they can stand, right? So older kids just stand, they pull their pants down, and then you can just you can smack them. That comes at about maybe six, six to eight years old. When they're younger, I lean them over like this. 
so over my body, so I can sort of lean on their body, and then their legs are here. When they're younger, you don't really need to restrain their legs, right? Because they, they kind of don't always know what's going on there with their legs. They don't realize that they can kick out of this, and you just pull their pants down and you spank them like that. Right? When they're older, what I've found is easy to do is when they start trying to kick, so about Abel's age is where they really start trying to get out of this, I kind of like just put my leg over their leg and kind of lock their bum in there and I can hold them down like this. And then their, their face is kind of there so that they muffles the screams a little bit. Pull their pants down and then I can spank them. If you're really having trouble, that's why it's good that both parents know what's going on, right? Because if you're really having trouble trying to restrain your child, to spank them. That's when sometimes Elizabeth will come over. There used to be times where Elizabeth would come over and hold the legs. Or if I was like, say, spanking Sarah, Simon would come over, right? Because something about siblings, they love seeing each other get spanked, right? They, they, you, know, <laughs> you know, they're always trying to get each other in trouble. Like Sarah will come over and be like, Simon's doing this, like trying to get them in trouble. So it's funny, like, they're, they're, they're crying and carrying on when they're getting spanked, but when they see their sibling get spanked, they'll come over. Simon will help hold the legs, you know, <laughs> things like that. I'm sure he'd love to actually operate the, the, the rod, but then he's not given that privilege yet. So it'll just be like that. that that's the position I've found helps, you know, and I'll switch maybe right or left, because it's easy to get one cheek <laughs> on one side. So if you keep doing it this way, you're only hitting the right cheek. I found with Simon it was funny because he sort of got used to getting hit on the right cheek and he didn't want to get hit on the left cheek because I think he's not getting hit on that one as, as much. So his left cheek actually hurt a bit more or is what, the other way around? Right cheek, yeah, right cheek. His, 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 his left cheek was getting softer. It's funny, like we, we laugh about it, they laugh about it. and it's, I don't know, it's funny. Even last night Elizabeth was saying that we were putting away these sticks and they were making sure there's one in every room. So I, just, I don't know always what's going on in their mind. Like, like they, they don't like it, but at the same time they kind of find it humorous. Yeah. So that's how you would restrain them. And, you know, all right, Simon. You'd use the same methods for different age kids. But the only difference is as they get older, you just use more force, right? So that's why I, I don't spank Noah any different to how I spank Simon in the sense that they get spanked on the bum. Simon, I don't need to restrain him anymore because I can get him to stand there and he just receives this correction. Whereas Noah, you kind of have to hold. And as you get older, they, they get to an age where they start restraining and then they get to an age when you can get them to stand there and then just take it. So, but I discipline them all the same way. It's just as they get older, they, it gets a bit harder and maybe more slaps. Now look at what the Bible says here. It says here, Chasten thy son while there is hope, and let not thy soul spare for his crying. So you see here, there should be crying resulting from a spanking, especially from younger children, right? And they will cry out, right? Sometimes they will cry out, they will plead with you to say, Daddy, don't spank me, Daddy, that's enough, after they've had one. And that's why the Bible says here, hey, you've got to chasten them and go through with it. Let not thy soul spare for their crying. You've got to go through with it because if you have too, if you're too soft, you're going to like just get, because they, you know, it, 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 like the Bible says, it's grievous at the time. And if you don't have thick enough skin, you're not going to do what is necessary. And some, that's why sometimes I wonder because I tell people, hey, you've got to discipline your children. And I give them tips how to do it. And I say, hey, this is how you do it. This is how hard you do it. This is how many times you do it. And I just wonder whether you guys are actually doing it. Right? It's, like, it's like when I speak to couples before they get married. And I say, make sure you talk about everything. And then I find out later on, they didn't talk about this. They didn't talk about that. They, but then before they got married, they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, we talked about everything. You know? So it's the same with like, spanking. They're like, well, I, yeah, I spank my kids. I'm so hard on them. And it's like, well, I, hopefully you are. Hopefully you do. Hopefully you take this advice on board because I think if you do, you'll see a difference. You know, my kids are not proof enough for you. I mean, there's so many kids I've seen where parents have been very disciplined in their discipline and their children are very pleasant, very polite, very well behaved. And that was one thing I remember learning when I was not a parent. I remember learning from somebody else uh, who had kids at the time and we were sort of talking about disciplining them. And she said to me, she said, a preacher's wife taught me once who had just really well-behaved kids. And she asked her, what was the secret? 
And she said, you know, under four years old, you've got to be really hard on them, really strict, really high standards. And it's like, if you're like that up to four years old, from then on, it's like easy sailing. And I was just like thinking at the time, I remember thinking at the time, four years old, like, man, that's so young. But now I, like, amen. Amen, sister. You know, all, you're up four, year, four years old is already like, you know, like way, like a character is already starting, you know, from way early on. They're already starting to disobey. So that's my, one of my advice to you. That's why if you start as early as possible, if you have really high standards, you're really strict, then later on, it's a bit easier, right? Because now it's just maintenance to habits and expectations you've already set in place. All right, so I know I'm preaching a bit longer, but I just want to go through this. I'll spend the last 15 minutes going through this, this age timeline, and I'll just give you some ages and sort of like certain... I'll give you examples. So Elizabeth and I kind of sat down and just thought, thought about, okay, at this age... What do we expect from our children? What, what, should they, what should you be able to expect them to do? Because really, when you think about the question, because we already talked about how to spank and principles, but if you're asking the question like, well, what, what do I spank the kids for? Like, do I spank them for this? Do I spank them for that? That's where you've got to kind of think about, well, what do I expect from my children? What sort of standard am I going to set? Because that's what you're going to spank them for. See, like if your standard is, well, they can touch the PowerPoints, you're not going to spank them for touching the PowerPoints. But if your standard is, no, you don't touch PowerPoints. I don't care if you're not sticking things into them, you don't even touch them. Then if they touch them, then they've overstepped their boundaries, right? If they overstep that boundary that you've set, then you know what to spank them for. So if you're wondering, what do I spank them for? That's when you need to talk with your wife and you need to decide, hey, these are the things we're going to expect from them. When they do this, you, you think, like, okay, I don't like them doing that. Do you like them doing it? You don't like, okay, when, next time they do that, that's not something we're going to let them do. So you come up with these sort of standards in your life. When they cross those boundaries, that's what you spank. So zero to three months is like they're newborn, right? So newborn, obviously, you know, they're just going to be eating and sleeping and whatnot. Three to nine months is when the kids start being aware of things. Right, they start being aware. So this is when, at about this age, it'll kind of be like the just getting into the habit of saying no to things. You know, they do something wrong, you say, no, don't do this, don't do this. But you're not really disciplining them like with spanking at that point, right? Saying no. Let's say, for example, you're holding a child and they're like pulling on things you don't want them to pull on. You know, you move their hand, you say no. Right? So you just, they start to realize, hey, there are things, there's boundaries, right? There's things that they don't do. There's things that I do and I get a reaction from my parents, right? Three to nine months, moving their hands away from things, maybe sitting them still, like just getting them to say, sit there, just try, then come up and try again. You just do small things like that. Then you get to nine to 18 months. So at nine to 18 months, so nine, 18 months, you know, year and a half, this is when they start getting spanked, right? And that's why I've just given ranges because obviously these are not exact timelines. You know, don't just think, you know, you, you, you know, eight months and, you know, 30 days and then eight months and what, nine months. Now, now you're getting it, you know? So it's just a, it's a gray area of timelines. So about roughly, because every child's going to be different. So at about this age, they start getting like the light spankings. And no, no would be like in this age bracket. So what are some examples of things that we would expect from them? At this age, one is that when they're getting changed on the change table, that they're not bucking and trying to roll over, touching their private parts. That's something that we try and get out of them, right? So you know when you have, that's why it's, you know, when you look on YouTube and you see like people changing their kids and they're rolling over and crawling all over and it's like humorous. To me, I just see like as, you know, surely these toddlers can be disciplined enough to lie down and get their diaper changed, right? You know, it's like when you see mum, you know, they, they say, oh, this is why it takes me so long to get ready as a mum, because she's like putting it into one cupboard and the child's at the other side pulling them out of the cupboard. And it's like, oh, it's so cute. I don't see that as cute. I think that's, that's so annoying. Why, why, doesn't this, why, why isn't this child getting disciplined to be taught that you can't just take things and throw them on the floor and they get a spanking? Like, that's what I mean by it. They train up a child. Like, you train them up and then they're, now they're a teenager throwing their clothes all over the place and you get angry at them. 
the rod of your anger is going to fail because you've, you've taught them that they can be messy. They don't need to clean up after themselves. Things like that. So um, I don't want to get off on these tangents. So one is like, you know, don't, they don't bark and turn over. What does that mean? They're on the change table. They shouldn't be like kicking and turning over and making it hard for you. Uh, also like not touching their private parts, right? So sometimes when you change the kids and they got like a poo diaper, you don't want your kid like, you know, the poo diaper and they're just down there and they're like, oh, and they start putting it all over their face and <laughs> things like that, right? So that's why you can train them at that age. You know, you just give them some light slaps on the thigh and you know, tell them no. When they put their hands down, you put it back up and you say, no, don't touch. Don't, you know, you, you, you can expect them to start to understand those things to the point when, you know, it'll get to the point where they get changed, they'll just sit there and get changed, right? Because you know they can't do anything else. What's another thing we expect from them at this age? No whining and moping, right? You take something away from, take a toy away from them and they're like, oh, That, we don't allow that in our house. If they start whining, they get a smack. All right, so you see how it's not that I'm saying, you know, these are just set things. These are things that we've decided on to say we don't want our children behaving that way. At this age, they can understand that if you do something to them and they don't like it, they react a certain way, you can spank that out of them. That's why the Bible says the rod of correction shall drive it far from them. You've got to try and think, whenever I spank them, this is a behavior or a, or a characteristic that I'm trying to get out of them. And that's why you want to start as early as possible because those characteristics start to show up very early. One year, one and a half year old, where you, know, you take away something from them and they're like, ah, they run away. You just go, ah, oh, you know, that's just what kids do. You know, when I take something away, it's just what they do, they'll get it. No, that's not acceptable, right? They take something away, they whine, you tell them, no, you can't whine. When I take something away, smack them, no whining next time. You know, and you just, you talk to them. They start to understand you, right? Because they're hearing you talking all the time. No tantrums, throwing themselves on the floor. This happens at one and a half years old, right? Even if they're not walking yet. You know, they're crawling around, take something from them, they go, ah! You know, oh, they're on the floor. They get, that, that you can start to train out of them. Not putting things or toys into their mouth. I don't like, I don't like this. I know some parents allow kids to put things into their mouth. We started around this age. You know, if they take a toy and they just start chewing, it's no. You start taking them out of the mouth. You can slap them on the hand. You can spank them for that. To get them out of the habit. Because remember, you're not just letting kids be kids. You can say, well, kids just put things in their mouth. I know kids put things in their mouth, but as an adult, as a teenager, you don't want them putting things in their mouth. Because like a young kid, you know, what are your kids out in the yard? And then they start putting things in their mouth. So you see how, like, you, you've got to train them to be how you want them to behave. And if you just let them do whatever, when they go out, they're going to do the same. What happens when they're in the toilet or whatever? You know, the kids, you know, you say, oh, I don't mind my kids sucking on their thumb. Yeah, well, what if they go around and wipe their hand in the toilet? You know, your kids do that at the shopping center and wipe their hand on the rail, you know? And then they're sucking their thumbs and then you wonder why they're sick all the time. They got ulcers in their mouth. It's because you, you let them just put stuff into their mouth. Right? That's why when the kids are walking at the... It's fine, I'm probably just thinking of all sorts of examples now. It's like when the kids are walking at the shopping center. You know, I don't want them just walking and just sliding their hand along the wall. Because I know like, later on they're going to eat or they're going to do stuff. So it's just things like that where you wouldn't do it. So teach your children not to do it. Well, you wouldn't do that, right? You wouldn't you know, slide your hand along that rail that's been touched by hundreds and hundreds of people. So you tell your children, no, you don't do it either. And you can expect that from them. Uh, let's go to the next age bracket. So that's like 9 to 18 months. One and a half to three years. So one and a half to three years, here are some examples. One is we start to expect them to eat all the food that they're given. Even, even new food they don't like. Right, so at about this age is when if we give you food, you give it, you, you take it. So it'd be like, open your mouth. You know, sometimes kids will be like, put the food in the mouth, and then they're like, no, they spit it all out. And then some parents are just like, oh, they just don't like it, you don't have to eat it. No. Put it in the mouth, they spit it out. You say, if you do that again, daddy's going to give you a smack. You try and put it back in the mouth, and if they don't, then you take them, you smack them. So 
it's, it's like, you know, you may not get compliance that day, but then they, they start to understand, oh, this is not acceptable. And tomorrow you do it again. And tomorrow you do it again. And then before you know it, when you say, ah, they just start eating. Right? Even things they don't like. You know, that's why our kids eat anything. Because if they didn't like it, we force them to eat it. You've got to like it. And then eventually they do like it. And then sometimes they like things that I don't even like. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, just, it's, just, it's just crazy. I don't know how that, how that works. So eat all food again. No throwing food on the floor or cups. So it's the same. You know, you know when they're eating there, and they eat, and then the kids just start throwing things. You know, and sometimes like they'll take their cup, they throw it on the floor, and you're like, don't do that. And they're like, ah, they just keep doing it. And you're like, well, you know, you just keep picking it up. No, you can discipline them. You can say, don't do it again. You, do, you throw it again, you're going to get a smack. Uh, we already talked about not touching certain things. So this is where Noah's age is at, right? Not touching certain things, PowerPoints. Cupboards. What do I mean by that? Cupboards. Like I said, like kids, they shouldn't just be able to like go into the kitchen and just pull open things and then just start rummaging. So at this age is where you can start disciplining them. You can expect them not to do that. You know, even Noah, like I remember like not going to certain areas of the house. I was working in the garage and, I told, and Noah kept coming into the garage and I told her, if you come into the garage again, daddy's going to give you a smack. And then she came in, so then I took her, and she carried, she's like, oh, because she knows when she gets carried like this by me. Because <laughs> normally I'll pick her up like this, but when I give her a spanking, I'm like lifting her legs up, I'm like holding her sideways. So she kind of knows, she starts going, oh, she knows she's going to get a smack. So she got a smack, and then she didn't come back into the garage, right? So, because I, I was working on some stuff, so I didn't want her in the way. Not going to certain areas. No hitting other children. So I would expect that at that age as well, when they play, you know, just smacking other kids. Um, another thing we expect is if they fall over, they can pick themselves back up without crying. I don't know if you guys ever thought about that. You know, when kids fall over, if you give them too much attention, they look at you first. Have you ever seen that? When they fall, they trip over, they look at you to see whether they should cry. And if you're like, oh, then they're like, ah, <laughs> they start crying. But if, you, if they fall over, you're just like, get up, come on. You know, you just ignore them. You know, you see them fall over and them, so you just ignore them. You just see if they get up. It's the same like when they're under a table. You know, sometimes kids are under a table and they stand up, they hit their head, right? <laughs> and some people, shh, not too loud, guys. They hit their head, right? And some people, then they'll, the kid, parents will look at them and then they'll start crying. But if they just let them hit their head, they'll learn eventually that if they stand up and then they, they learn to be more careful. And that happens at about this age. No climbing and jumping on tables and couches. At this age, I expect them when I say come, that they come. They come when they're called. So even at Noah, if I'll say, come here, Noah, and she doesn't come, you know, this is the age where I start expecting her to come. And uh, same with like simple tasks. So, so when they're younger, I start to do things like, it's funny because I'll spank them. <laughs> I'll spank them. And then I'll wipe their face with the tissue and everything. And then I'll give them the tissue to go throw in the bin. And then they'll go <laughs> throw it away so they, they can throw away their own tissue. So just simple tasks like that, you can start expecting from them at this age where you give them something to do and then they, they go and do it. Just a simple task. All right, two more age brackets and then we'll be done. I know this topic is very interesting. You can talk, I can talk forever. Three to six years is the next bracket. Here are some examples of things we'd expect at three to six years. Um, you know, they, they'd help pick up and put things away, but with supervision, right? So you might say, hey, well, they, they can pick up a toy. You can say, hey, put that toy away and clean some things up. They'll start at this age knowing where things go. And you have to be organized in the house so things have a place to go, right? Because kids can learn. If you tell them, hey, this goes here, then they'll know next time that it goes there, right? Helping take groceries into the house. You know, not making a mess, whether accident or not. So let's say at three to six years old, your, your kids, you know, maybe we've got a water fountain in the house, right? The cooler, we have it just sitting in our house. You know, if they get their water, they spill the water and they think it's funny. I don't think that's funny. Because <laughs> that's teaching them it's okay to make a mess. So those are the sort of things that they might get in trouble for. Not making a mess, uh, spilling water, or even tipping out toys. You know, sometimes kids just like making a mess. Like they'll just, you know, you've packed everything away nicely, like some pieces of paper or something. They just go over, they just dump it out. 
And you're just like, ah, there's, there's dumb things out. And you're just like, don't do that, don't do that. You just pick it up and then go away. No, say, don't do that. If you do it again, you're going to get in trouble. And if they do it again, so you see how like, I'm, we, we, we are constantly reinforcing these things and upping the standard. Not damaging property or destroying toys unnecessarily. So that's when, how they play. We teach them, yeah, you've got to play with things and respect property. Because if, if you train your child the way they play with their toys, it's just they just get things, and just throw it and smash it against the wall. What are you training? You've got to think, whatever you allow your children to do, because you might think, oh, I don't care, because they're just doing it at home. Yeah, but the problem is, you've got to think of your home as the training ground of how you want them to behave when they're somewhere else. So if you let them do that at home, and then they're going to do that at somebody else's house. They're going to do that when they're out and about. So think about those things, the way you train your children. What you allow at home is what they're going to do out and about. So not damaging property. Immediate obedience. That's one thing we expect. So when we say something like, stop and turn the iPad off, it goes off immediately. Right? And then I'll ask them, did you hear me say that? They say, yes, they're going to be in trouble. They're going to sit quietly at church, sit quietly when we're reading them a book. Sit patiently at the dinner table at this age. Right, so at the dinner table, they're not sitting there playing with the cutlery, banging the table, moving their plate. These are the sort of things that you can expect at this age. Not play with things that they can do themselves. So at this age, they start to be able to go to the toilet themselves. They start to wash their hands themselves. So they're not allowed to play, go in there and play with the taps. You know, flush the toilet whenever they want. Things like that. Not play at bedtime. And about this age is when they start expressing themselves, right? So you can have them express the, their emotions, explain to you how they're feeling and things like that. And you can talk to them. I just talk to my kids like adults, really. I remember Pete asked me once, so Simon came over a couple of years ago, asked me something, and I just spoke to him like how I would speak to you guys. And Pete made the comment, he goes, man, you just speak to your kids like they're adults. And I'm like, yeah, well, how else would I speak to them? I just explain, because they understand. They understand what I'm saying. I just speak to them and explain things to them like I would anybody else. Obviously it may take a little bit more explanation and in different words, but it's not like I change my tone of voice or anything. So that's three to six years old. The last one is six plus. That's probably the extent of our experience right now. Simon's eight years old. Six plus years. At this age is when I think you can really start expecting a lot more from them. This would be, I'll just read out this list, complete tasks to standard without supervision. So this is when I can say to Simon at this age, or Timothy, clean up this room, and when I come back, I want to see it clean. Right? So that I can hold them to that standard. Uh, and obviously kids are not perfect. So when I give you these examples, they don't do them perfectly. I'm just saying this is what I want to expect from them. This is the standard I'm trying to hold them to, to up their character. You know, cleaning up toys or messes. So they actually help at this age to vacuum and sweep and wipe things. Like you guys don't see it when we come here in the mornings. Sometimes there's stuff around on the floor and we can get Simon and Timothy and say, I can tell Simon, hey, go hand sweep up all those little things. And I, ex I expect him to do that. Uh, setting table, clearing plates, bedroom and clothes kept neat and tidy. So they shouldn't have to trash all their clothes and things like that. We expect them to fold them and put them away neatly. Shoes put away. So when they come home and they take their shoes off, do you just let their kids just throw them wherever? No, you should, you should teach them to be neat and tidy and to put those away. Clothes in the laundry basket. You wash themselves properly without playing around in the, in the shower. Uh, we have a toilet stool, so if, if, if they use the toilet stool, I expect them to put it back where it belongs. We even expect our kids, if they, you know when they use up the rest of the toilet roll? They, they have to change that. They don't change that. So the, you see how these are just habits and characteristics. You say like, Oh, you know, why are you being so hard on your kids? Well, no, because this is how we want, this is how you teach your kids how to be like a responsible adult, is you start training them young and expecting them, expecting it from them. Get changed, get ready for bed. Complete schoolwork, unsupervised. Sit still in church and at dinner. What about this one? A more selfless attitude when playing. I would expect that at six plus years old. You know, when they come over, and like say Simon's crying, saying, oh, they didn't let me play this, they didn't let me do this. That's not acceptable anymore because now you want to start teaching them, hey, when you play, it's about, so it's about helping other people to have fun. 
and then they'll learn when you help others have fun, you have fun as well. So having a serving attitude. Also saying, you know, kids expect other kids to always share their toys with them. So it's teaching them that attitude of service where, hey, they're not just there to help you have fun, but you ought to have a mind of service where you help them have fun. Getting themselves ready to go in the morning. So like, say, Simon and Timothy, they have soccer practice. I'm not going to get all their stuff ready for them put their shoes on, find their shin pads, find their water bottle. No, they get all that stuff ready. You know, you know we got to leave at four o'clock. So at four o'clock, you're going to be ready. You're going to have your shoes on. You're going to have your shin pads. You're going to have your water bottle filled up so that when I go, you're ready to go. See, so have, you can have those expectations at this age that they can be like adults now. They can start looking after themselves. But then you've got to think, if you expect this from them, I don't know what your standards are like. Right? So you may, you may not have these standards, but I just think these are the sort of things we implement. It makes our life a lot easier. So just some closing thoughts is, obviously I'm not saying my children are perfect, but these are the things that we expect from them. Obviously it's not exact ages. Right? It's, a, it's just, a, just a rough timeline to give you an example. But figuring out what they're capable of, it requires you to spend time with your children. Right, so you need to spend time with them and talk with them because then you're going to understand what they're capable of. And if, if you know that they're capable of something, then you can hold them to that standard. So you need to have that relationship with your children to have that level of understanding. But I will say this, don't underestimate the capacity of your children to understand at a very young age. You know, you don't think like, because people just let their kids get away with things at two, three, four, five years old, and they think, oh, they're too young, they don't get it. No, they, start, they understand very quickly. Like even Abel's age, he's starting to understand things very quickly. So by Simon's age, and they know what's going on. You know, if you think he doesn't know what's going on, I mean, he's probably just got you deceived, right? This kid, this boy, he's a smart one, <laughs> Simon, especially. So they know. Right? Don't underestimate the capability of your children to understand. Um, and some of you, unfortunately, may need to learn some of these behaviours as, as an adult you know, if you're going to implement these with your kids. Because if you're not doing them, you can't really expect your kids to do them in terms of cleanliness and things like that. The last thing I want to say is, you may mock. Right? You, may, you may say, ah, oh, Victor, you just, that's just you. You know, you just have these high standards. Um, if I was you, I would take heed. I would hear the instruction. Because this is what enables you to cope with many children. You say, Victor, why do you get them to do this? You're so hard on them. You have such high standards. Because that's what's going to allow you to have more kids. Because if think about it, if you're already so big, busy picking up after one kid and doing this for one kid, oh, they throw their clothes around, you've got to pick those up. Oh, you didn't put your shoes away, I put the shoes away. Oh, imagine when you have five. So if you want to have a lot of kids, you better up the standard. Right? And if you up the standard and you get them to you train them to be responsible children, clean, organized. And your house is going to be running like clockwork. It's going to be a lot easier for you. Okay, so if you want a lot of children, you better take heed because sometimes when I go through lists like this, people just laugh and just, you know, be, oh, you know, why are you so strict? That's the reason. All right, so hopefully that was a blessing for you. I know it was a long sermon, but hopefully you learned a lot from it. You can listen back to the recording a bit later. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for... Uh, your word. I just pray that this sermon was a bit more practical for people, give them a bit of insight into our house and how we uh, raise our children, what we expect from them. And I just pray, Lord, that that helps them to understand, you know, what to spank for, how to spank, uh, how to discipline, how to have the right attitude, how to balance uh, love, uh, the rod and reproof. So, Lord, you are the perfect example how you deal with us. So if we just have, Lord, that mindset, just be, try and be more Christ-like uh, to our children. And uh, I just pray, Lord, that we don't leave it till too late, that we are diligent with training our children with the little time that we have. So help us, Lord, to raise godly children and help us to raise as many godly children as we can. 
and we will be able to experience the promise in your word that they will give us rest and delight to our soul. So I say amen to that. So we thank you, Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.